for the veterans amongst you. Uh, this is the panel. Every day we have a panel. First two days, it's about articles that have been published in the last year that um, we think are noteworthy, but which didn't get into the lectures. Every once in a while, we screwed up, and one of these is in one of the lectures, and we'll just go, we'll just uh, ignore that one because it's already being covered. Um, this this uh, session, the next two days, uh, even more important, more valuable if you guys participate. So please, your comments and thoughts are welcome. And uh, we'll just get started. We're going to have a discussion of each of these. Some of the articles we'll spend too long on, some we'll spend very short time on, but we'll, we'll make our way through. And um, each one of us, in rotating order, will present the article and then open it up to discussion on the panel and discussion with you guys. So I get the, the first one. The first topic, series of articles, are about pediatrics. Uh, David did a, a lecture on a couple of pediatric topics. This one, the number one, is from the group at USC uh, on ALTIs, acute life-threatening events, which, as you know, is um, something that has no really clear definition or diagnostic um, or tests to tell us what it is. It's basically a syndrome where somebody got really worried because something happened and it could have been a big deal. And as you know, this is a little bit like syncope in adults. We're going to have a whole lecture on syncope where the vast majority, either they're obviously sick, there's a few of them who are obviously sick, that's easy, and the vast majority look fine and in that group almost all of them are fine. But one of them hiding in there is the needle in the haystack that, if you don't catch it, might come back with something really bad. So the question always is, how hard do you go looking for the needle in the haystack? And one of the things we always talk about is, you better find it, because if that kid really is really something bad and you miss it, oh my God, it's terrible. What we don't talk about is what's the harm in going looking. And because when you go look, most of the time they're fine, you have the potential to harm a lot of kids and you only have the potential to help that one little ne needle in that whole huge haystack. So keeping that in mind, uh, number uh, one is a prospective series in over 500 kids where somebody thought they met this definition of an LT. That's about as big a series as you're ever going to get and it probably tells us as much as any study is ever going to tell us even though, it, unfortunately, it doesn't really answer the question, the important question, which is, can you find that needle without causing lots and lots of harm? So there's a few things in here. In these, amongst these kids, most of them, many of them got, uh, this article is about, are they infected? Is there an occult infection in there in these kids who look well? So in this series, a lot of these kids got a test looking for infection. They, some of them got chest x-rays, some of them got white count, some of them got urine, a few of them got an LP, and the, the main message here is that very few of them turned out to be positive. Amongst the urines, there are a few positives, and most of them were probably false positive uh, uh, asymptomatic bacteria, who cares? We don't know for sure. But in any case, most of the time when they got a test, nothing came of it. When they had a chest x-ray, a few of them were positive. Those were kids who looked like clinically they had pneumonia. So that wasn't terribly useful. So the, the authors tell us that their conclusion from this is don't go looking for something if you don't have a reason to go, at least for an infectious thing, don't go looking unless you have a clinical reason to do it. And I think, I'm pretty sure that's the right answer, but again, it doesn't really tell us because most of the patients didn't get a test and we don't know what happened to them. And if they missed something, we don't know about it. This is sort of hoping that the ones where they didn't find anything and they went home and they didn't come back the next day dead, that that means that they really were okay. And I don't know that that's true because we don't know. Uh, particularly where this was done, they might have gone back to a different hospital with a problem. So uh, I think we're, we're left where we always are, which is that most of these kids look fine. I believe their conclusion is the right one. Don't go looking for trouble if you don't need to. You're going to do more harm than good. But there is going to be a needle in there somewhere, and this doesn't tell us is there a safe way to find it. But doing an LP on these kids is a task, and it's a chore, and sometimes it's something that's asked of you of the inpatient service, please help. And although LPs were done on 12% of the kids, this is a huge series, 500. You're not going to see another one this big published in your clinical lifetime, and not one of those LPs were positive. So unless they're an obviously sick looking like meningitis, 
I would use this paper as a reason to say, you know, I don't think they need an LP. Why don't you look at them upstairs and make that decision? One of the, this paper doesn't talk about, but one of the things I think is useful is the notion that there are kids who have an obvious uh, benign reason for it. When you can find one of those, that's really good. It clearly was spitting up, don't, you know, then, then you're done. The spit but, up, choke, turn blue. If there's a good history of GERD or of, of that type of thing, I agree. Well, turn blue, I give, if they really turn blue, but that's hard to, to say. But in any case, you know, you're, so again, there's no, we talked about gold standards. There's no gold standard here. We're, we're making this up as we go along. The bottom line is most of them are fine, and if they look fine, don't get overly crazy. But if there's a really good story that the kid wasn't breathing for, you know, 10 seconds and really became limp, then you better have a good reason not to. So not, there's one other thing that I, I look, I focus on in this disease, and I'm interested in what the panels think. So of some of these kids who looked well that got an RSV test, and RSV is known, particularly in, in small kids under three months, to sometimes cause apneic episodes and things like that in them. And so RSV was positive in 11.8%. I know what Jerry's going to say, which is that this isn't good enough to tell you what the true yield of RSV is. But for me, because an RSV swab is not that difficult a thing to do, I think if I'm seeing an Altia and a kid who's, who's on the younger side, because some of these kids look pretty well, I t although I agree that the methods don't really uh, prove this in any convincing way, I latch on to that as being one of the important concepts. So what do you think, Di? I I'm RSV in these kids. Yeah, most of the, actually, most of the kids in our place get RSV tests. They get a lot of the tests, actually. Not all LPs, though. And, and part of the, one of the other authors of this paper came from our institution, uh, and they're doing other data, other gatherings, another study of 1,000 a, a kids with ALTI. And the, the few things that you can actually... All right, maybe you will see a bigger study. I take that back. <laughs> yeah. Damn but, it. Darn, darn. <laughs> but th there are a few things that, that raise my suspicion. One of the things about this paper for the RSV is that only a third of the kids got RSV tested, and there's got to be a reason that was done. Um, I wonder how many of those kids had some subtle respiratory thing that made Fever, you want... Fever, boogers. Right, something that made you want to do the test in the first place. But there are certain kids that ALTI are, are higher risk, no question. Young ki kids, kids who've had an ALTI more than once. Um, kids who have respiratory symptoms, they look sick, they're febrile. Those are the ones that you really focus on. The other ones, I don't think, I agree with you totally, don't go crazy with LPs and all this in these kids, but RSV tests are cheap. Yeah, so RSV <laughs> is one of the things that stood out to me, although I would be the first to agree with Jared and say it didn't prove it. Yeah, but I'll tell you, this is, we don't know which kids are the ones that needle in the haystack and ALTI. And the problem with ALTI is it's not our diagnosis, right? It's the family that had something happen that worried them enough that they thought the child was either stopped breathing or had died. I mean, they, were, they really thought there was a life threat. And that's, that, that's what makes it, I think, the hardest, is that it's, it's not something we actually have seen. It's something that the family brings them in for. Right, and, and even, um, you know, you sometimes get a sense of who's the parent and the parent who's describe something that really is worrisome, or somebody seems like, you know, really a little hysterical, and it really doesn't seem like it really was that big a deal, but that's precisely the person who's going to have the hardest time accepting, don't worry, and go home. So it's, it's sort of like a, a, a vicious cycle. Um, I, you know, Diane made a really important point, which has nothing to do with this paper, but which is the sickest ones are the ones who are really, really, really little, or have had multiple events. And so those cases, you know, go over the top. But again, I, you know, this is a theme I'm going to come back to over and over and over again. We always talk about what's the harm of not doing, not finding. We didn't find that needle and a kid came back and died and that's terrible, that is. But we very rarely talk about what's the harm of overdoing, taking lots and lots of kids, the vast majority of whom are fine, and submit, even putting them in the hospital. That's not a good experience, that's a really bad experience. Not to mention that it has medical consequences too. Hospitals are a really dangerous place for a really little kid to be. So we never measure that. And maybe in many cases where we do know what's going on, we do more harm than good by screening, for example, for most things. So just be aware of that. But unfortunately, this doesn't tell us the answer. I think we have some clues. Any thoughts you guys have? Hmm. I was oh, yeah, just going to yeah. say, my, my take on this is much how we now look at febrile seizure in kids. That I think in years past, that used to trigger an automatic workup. And then we realized that it's just the fever, and you deal with what is in front of you. And that's the conclusion, really, of this paper, that it's not necessarily the event that brought them in, but you deal with the kid in front of you. I think the hardest is, not honestly, is keeping them or not. It's, it used to be just a routine that all of them got admitted. And there's more 
push back on that, but I'm still not exactly sure which ones are totally safe to send home. I know there's, I know the high risk ones that I'm very comfortable saying this needs to stay. It's that, where do you really feel comfortable sending them home? Right. And, that, and that's, that's, that's the hard part. And the to last thing this. I want these peeves researchers to do is come up with some validated protocol to tell me which Alti can go home. Cause I'm happy right now being a dumb, dedicated first but they're not doctor ever do that. and admitting them. It's right. not going to happen. But anyway, uh, I think that's where it's a little different than a febrile seizure is that in febrile seizures, we know that it's safe to go home. So they look okay. If you do a good exam, it's safe to go home. There are no needles in that haystack, essentially none. Whereas here, there are a couple of kids who look every once in a while, this kid who looks good and comes back dead. And oh, I don't know that, the, you that can does. Find that. that reminds me, SIDS and ALTI have nothing to do with each other. Um, the idea that that Alti kids were the kids that went on to have SIDS has really been debunked. Yeah. Um, and SIDS is much more have to do with sleep position and a few other things that we actually can have some impact on. But th so so if SIDS comes into the conversation when you're talking about I don't want to go home and have my child, you know, SIDS is not they're not in, they don't relate to one another at all. They're separate entities entirely. SIDS and Alti. All right, number two, abstract number two, those of us who have been practicing long enough to have gray around the temples have been through every possible iteration of what to do for some poor little munchkin who has a fever. Um, people made their entire academic careers doing research on this. And what's interesting over the eons, and I, honestly, the reason that things have changed so dramatically is those nerds that you went to school with who had the pocket protectors and the calculators went and did research on vaccines. And they saved a bazillion more lives than you and I ever will collectively. But what that did was really change the playing field for febrile children. So now that we have the Hib vaccine and the pneumococcal vaccine, which is now even a better pneumococcal vaccine, we're seeing less and less and less true life-threatening. For instance, my residents, were, were, uh, they were musing the other day about that interesting disease that you all used to see, epiglottitis in children. It's like, are you, that used to strike absolute abject terror in most of us practicing back then. You don't see it anymore. The average age is in the late 20s now for that disease. So the, so the, the, the whole playing field has changed, meaning that a febrile baby now is different than a febrile baby was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. They're just different because the herd immunity is such that the things that used to kill them, they don't get anymore. They're actually rare. So what that's done is take the febrile workup for a baby and drop the age lower and lower and lower. It used to be three months and then it was two months and then now it's 28 days and it's kind of sticking at 28 days, I think for a pretty good reason. But this is, let me talk about this paper and then sort of where things are going. What they did in this particular paper is it was pediatric EDs, so you have a slanted <laughs> patient population. It's, it's you know, people that work with babies, which, which I think is important because we'll talk about what they did or didn't do in a second. It was 2,200 of these kids under the age of 28 days who came in with a fever with unknown source. And the febrile baby workup recommendation was, a C, uh, the sepsis workup, was a CBC, a UA, LP, blood and urine and CSF cultures, and maybe a chest x-ray, and then admission and parenteral antibiotics. So that was the recommendation sort of as the general, this is what we should do, which they didn't do in these pediatric emergency departments. Just point number one, it wasn't done across the board in all of these pediatric emergency departments. Only 73% of the kids got any of the studies and the range, the lowest range was 38% that didn't get this full sepsis workup. So it means 60% in this pediatric emergency department, they didn't do it, didn't even do the workup, which is fascinating to me. I think that's really interesting. But if you um, don't do it, they'll be the first to throw you under the bridge. Yes, they will. Under the bus as a cavalier emergency physician who doesn't care about kids. Right. And 16% of these babies that were, to me, to me, these are easy. You have a 28 day old or 26 day old who comes in with a fever. It's a ka done, workup in, finished, where it's easy. They sent home some of these kids. 16% of these kids actually went home from the emergency department. So as low as 40% got the full workup, 16% even went home, which is fat. And the point of this paper is this big variability in practice. Not that many kids were sick um, overall. One kid of all of them had a serious bacterial illness. I don't think that's the point of the paper. And the, the misses. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So we, so there were 12% that oh. had something that got admitted. And, but even with this behavior where they were sending a lot of people home, they only missed one kid with an SP. Right. Now, not, now that's not, not to say this was the right practice. What I think is fascinating about this is that we do know that that is the risk group still of baby, the, neo, the neonates. For sure, the first two weeks, probably the first 28 days. That's the group still at risk for having the things that you would get related to birth. 
So this is the gram negatives. This is the listeria. This is, these are the kids that can get the bad things related to birth. And so that's, that to me, there's a, only so far I'm going to feel comfortable lowering the bar. At 28 days, things do seem to change. And you can watch children. You can actually see kids and see how they react and how they behave. They're not all just total little cute little blobs that just eat, drink, and poop. Yeah. They, they actually have, you can actually sort of see their behavior. But under 28 days, their behavior doesn't count. And they're still at risk for some of those bad bugs that after 28 days, they just don't have as much of a risk for. So this is just interesting. The variability of practice is huge. They didn't miss much, but that didn't mean they did the right thing. Let, can I, uh, let me just stress what I think are a couple of points that have been said, but I just want to stress them. So um, there are two reasons why you might be really worried about younger kids. One is because they're sicker, and the other is they're not sicker. It's just that it's harder for us to know which one's sick. And I think the latter is really the case. So it used to be, as Diane said, we used to say, well, under three months old, you have to worry. But if you actually look at all of these age groups, the number of people who are really sick or have something important is about the same. It's about 5% of the ones who are febrile. Most of them end up having nothing. In this study, 12% had something. And there were two things that were interesting about that. One was 12% ended up with a diagnosis of something important, this serious bacterial illness, okay? But all, all but one of those kids were clinically obvious. So even in very little kids, we can tell the one who looks really bad. What we're worried about is the one who I can't really, really tell, looks okay to me, but how do I know what's normal in a one week old? So if they don't look really bad, there was only one such case that was a cult. Somebody who they didn't say, yeah, this is an obviously a sick kid and turned out to have it. Of the 12% who came up with a diagnosis of serious bacterial illness, if you actually go look at the paper, only about 5%, just under half of them, actually had something that mattered. They were really sick. They were septic or they had bad pneumonia or they had meningitis. The others had urinary tract infection, which most of the time is nothing. So again, it's not that these are, that you see a kid, so you see a kid who's 12 days old or whatever it is, um, they look sick, it's easy. They look well, if they're two months old, we can tell. If they look well, they're okay. If they're one week old or 15 days old or something like that, we should be humble about, you know what, maybe I can't tell. But even in that group, the vast majority of them are fine. It's not that they're likely to be sick, most of them are fine. Just be sure you feel comfortable saying they're fine. If you don't feel comfortable, and most of us don't think we really know what, a, what, what is abnormal in a two-week-old, then that's why we're more caref careful in them. Not because they're sicker, but just because it's harder to tell. But in this study, they, they, occult, injury, occult bad was almost non-existent, even in these little tiny kids. All right, that takes us to abstract three, which is about a fascinating sort of state-oriented European program. It's called the Amsterdam Policy. There's all kinds of ethical things to talk about if you want to do that, but let's just talk about what the program is. It, uh, Dave get, talked about child abuse, and obviously the big problem when you see child abuse is to, to identify it, because if you don't, and they go back to the abuse environment, they come back either more injured or dead. And so that, that epi is pretty well known, that missing child abuse has terrible consequences. But you were at least starting with care for the child. What this is, is the other way around. You're starting with care for the adult and recognizing that there might be problems for a child if there is one in that adult's house or home that you should then go after. So the child's not even in front of you. So the Amsterdam policy is that whenever a parent presents with domestic violence, substance abuse, suicidal ideation, and you find out that there's kids in that house, you do a referral. And this, they say it's voluntary, but it's sort of twisted voluntary. And that 81 of the referrals from that visit said, okay, fine, let's, let's do the referral and help my kids. Um, but of those who refused, the government got involved in the other 25, so it's not that voluntary because there were only 106 kids in this from 60 households. Now, what were the parent presentations that brought them in? So mostly this was a mom who was beat up by the, their partner in the home. So it's in, um, intimate partner violence. You're seeing a woman who's been beat up at home and there's kids there. And so then you go look into it. 
and you refer. And 77 of these 106 kids were referred. Maltreatment of the kids was found within, over the last year in a large number of these kids. That maltreatment existed mostly in the form of a child that witnessed domestic violence. So it wasn't that the kid was smacked, it's that the kid watched mom being smacked. And well, trust me, I'm not trying to minimize that in any way. Watching it is not as bad as being smacked, but it's still bad. Um, and then they described this as being a successful program. The thing I would say about this in terms of the ethics is we as emergency physicians, um, I like emergency medicine both when my relationship is with the patient in front of me, and I really don't like it when the government or the state intrudes on this. And trust me, I'm not some liberalist, you know, some libertarian right-wing freak. I, I mean, I do the thing, you know, obviously domestic <laughs> violence reporting and things like that. Uh, you know, I do them. The disease reporting, I do them. Well, anytime you're doing those types of things, you're functioning as an agent of the state. This is really weird because it's asking you to extend from the patient in front of you to a patient that's not in front of you and act as an agent of the state via referral. Now, no doubt that this is a problem um, and referring these kids successfully, I think, is a win. I, I just find it a little hard to imagine myself going from the patient in front of me to moving my care sphere to someone who's not in front of me. And so there's lots to debate about this, but uh, I had never really heard of the Amsterdam policy before. Anyone had heard of this before? I had never heard of the Amsterdam policy before I read this paper. And I have to say, when I read this paper, I was a little bit challenged by the whole idea of, of having a responsibility to someone who's not in front of me as a patient even. Um, but there you go. And but we do that all the time with, uh, with se sexually transmitted with diseases, STDs. for example. Yep. Uh, and we I, don't, I don't have any problem with this, although I'm very much very cautious about being an agent of the state. I think that can be easily abused. We should be very careful about it. And even some things like mandatory reporting of suspected partner abuse, I think, is actually counterproductive and causes harm. So I don't, I don't think we should do this easily. But I, to me, this is a no-brainer. When you see a, a, a family where there is abuse going on, or even drug abuse that's causing people to come into the hospital, and their children in that. The children are victims in that case. And I think, just like Dave said before, our job is not to make a diagnosis, it's to get the process started, regardless of this particular program and how they did it, et cetera. The notion that we should be aware that, oh my God, there's a kid in that house, this is not a healthy place for that kid, we should try to get some help for that kid, social service involved. That's a fabulous idea, we should try to get social service but involved. But they, they included, for example, in this substance abuse, if I oh, referred geez. every drunk parent Alcohol. who came yeah. to my emergency room for any type of visit, Jesus Christ, the line, I mean, it, we spend a lot of time putting blinders on. So in our minor trauma area, right, it's broken ankle, fell off skateboard. It's fell on an outstretched hand, broken wrist. But that's not the whole story. It's fell on arm on outstretched wrist after five margaritas referral. Is there a kid in that house? I'm going to send them to refer them to the government. So Broke their ankle on a skateboard. It was after about referring two... To the two Okay, so, okay, so forget the about referring to the government for a second, but how about the notion that it is useful for, that when you see it of, 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 of dysfunctional family for any of these reasons that has reached a level that they're coming to the ER, that you should worry about the child and try to get the child help, I think is a really important one. And while you're right that at your particular place, you don't have enough social workers to do it for all the drunks who would come in and all yeah, the children. Yeah, we're a level one alcohol receiving. I suspect, <laughs> I suspect that you do more good by getting help for a kid. I mean, I can't prove this, but you do more than most of what we do that we congratulate ourselves about our treatment. So what, you know, I think thing, it's an important thing. The thing this paper did for me, because I, I work in a very similar environment to Billy's. We're, we're just basically big county small. Um, they call us little county. But what it did do for me is... is brought up a whole different way of approaching people who are suicidal or alcohol or drug dependent or victims of violence, and that was to bring up the children and to say, with, with, you know, do you have kids, do you want some help? You know, this is really hard for everybody in your family, and we have, you know, to help you and your children, is there something we can do to help you? And we have really, we have 24-hour social work now, which is like a miracle yep. in our emergency department, which has been a godsend, an absolute godsend. And our social workers are angels on earth. They are unbelievably fabulous. And if you bring a child into that, that I was, I'm amazed how, the, if you bring it up, the parents wouldn't help themselves, 
But often when their child is now the discussion, they are open to the idea. And it's not being referred to the state. It's just that's offering something. that's why 81 did do it voluntarily, 81 yeah. out of 100. It was pretty neat, actually. And, and our social workers are totally into this. They, because most of what they do is really hard, getting a homeless person a place to live, talking to a family of, you know, whose fa loved one just died. Here's something they actually feel like they can get their teeth into and really do something great. So our social workers have kind of gotten into this as well. So it's just another way to talk to people. I, I think it's pretty cool. I, th I think certainly, and, and my, one of my objections was the substance abuse thing. We see all kinds of people who are drunk. I, I got it. There's domestic violence. You got a suicidal mom. I'm all for, you know, I think those are far easier triggers for me than someone's got an alcohol level of 250 or, or, or clinically intoxicated. I don't know if that means their home I mean, environment. Alcohol level abusive. is 250 and you got a one month old. Something's, there's danger there. There's, so just keep it in mind. Just do with it what you think is appropriate, but of being aware that there are children at risk, I think, can be useful. Well, the study I don't think really proves this, yeah. and I don't think we know about how eff efficacious any of these are. And I think for us, the, 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 the take home is not redo this program or take any of the elements that they specifically used, but just be aware that when there is a child in a home that's dysfunctional, there's another potential victim and try to think about is there some way you can get them help and probably for all of us we have very different access to very different social services so it's not one size that fits all just being aware of it is I think the key yeah and, and this you know clearly this is just a descriptive paper of the Amsterdam and some of their numbers it doesn't compare it to anything else um, right. and, but but it was high yield well, this, and, the description just, provided is right. very high yield. Of any, just for any, just as a parallel idea of efficacy, the elder abuse reporting, um, and anyone can report, you know, anybody, a neighbor, anybody, that um, when they they find something real, fifty six percent of the time, which tells me we're under questioning sure. it. If if half the time it's confirmed, we're probably under sensing it. So I think there's the efficacy of these things when they do get used is pretty good. I think. Okay, we're averaging 10 minutes per paper, so... I Pick it up, baby. It's about average. Yeah. It's about Pick it up. <laughs> All right, duration of symptoms of respiratory tract infection of children, systematic review. Very quickly, I think there are some good take-homes here. So it's just they took 40, 50 papers that tried to describe duration of symptoms in viral illness in kids. And the main point is that these things often last a lot longer than we tell people. So we'll tell them, oh, the kid will be better in four days in a week. And that's sometimes true. So I think the way to think about this is painful conditions, like a sore throat or an earache, those are often better in about a week. But the other conditions that are respiratory, that are cough, the bronchiolitis, they can go on for three, four weeks. So if you tell mom that the kid should be better in a week, that means when the kid isn't better in a week, which is predictable, they'll be back in. So the point of this is that you tell the family, what the actual duration of illness is. So yes, this cough may last for three or four weeks. The respiratory symptoms may last for close to a month. And then that hopefully just resets the uh, bar for the fa family to know what to expect to not to rush it back in unnecessarily. Oh, and then if so it lasts key. more than a yeah. month, it's gonna be TB or pertussis. Yeah. So pertussis is the 100 day cough and uh, TB is, uh, you know, you cough until you die. The good news is yeah. that croup is only two days, only lasts a couple of days, so yeah. that's at the other extreme. Right. Um, but again, you know, if you say, well, let's not use antibiotics now, but if he's not better in a couple of days, well, you're asking for trouble. This yeah. is that overpromise and underperform sort of Disney approach to the world. You know, it works. If you're standing in line at Disneyland and it says for 45 minutes from here to the ride and you get there in 30, you think you scored. Right? You absolutely think you scored. It's like the ETAs for airlines. They're always on time because they add 20 minutes to the estimated thing, and then they're always on time, and you feel like it's a good thing. It's the same thing here. You're managing expectations, and I think it's really it, it's key. It keeps people from coming back. So this season in particular, I don't know about you guys, everyone on cough. the planet coughed for six to eight weeks. I swear everybody did. My, My husband works in urgent care. He was ready to blow his brains out. A they million coughed times for so long that they got barotrauma to their ears. Yeah, Honest to God, crazy, I was seeing people with crazy. ear pain 
And when you get down to it, what the story was, I coughed until I practically blew my ears off my head. So I, I saw a lot, and there was no infection in their ears. They just had barrow trauma from coughing. I love the notion of expectations and how, you know, if, if you wait, uh, if they say it's going to be 15 minutes and it's 30 minutes, you're really pissed. And if it's, they said 40 minutes and it's 30 minutes, it's great, even though it's exactly the same thing. Um, so I love the, 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 the example of the airlines because they're now always on time because of exactly what Di Diane said. But my favorite is when they say, and we got an early arrival. We came in 15 minutes before we were scheduled. It's like, what, did we all like beat our you know, wings? <laughs> and the, we, we went faster because, you know. A tailwind. There's no A way. A tailwind that, whipped up. You can't get in earlier. They, nobody, there's no way for the plane to go faster. It just means they lie at their expected time. I love it when they say we landed earlier, and but the gate gate's not occupied. available. <laughs> yeah. So they get credit for arriving earlier, then I don't get off the plane for another hour. And then... <laughs> I'm anyway. just sitting there going, oh, God. So the, the, the other thing is that language is important. Number five is about the importance of language, and, and it is really, really important. There was a study we did a few years ago which said, if, which, where they actually took people in a waiting room, and they said, look, you know, you came in with, look at this thing. This is a, a situation. Imagine you were the patient. And they gave them a situation where they had a cold, you know, and they were coughing, and it was no big deal. It was a respiratory infection. And described it and at the end they said, it said the doctor says you have acute bronchitis and then they asked the patients what do you what does the doctor have to do for you and the patients all said most of them said well I guess I need antibiotics bronchitis I need antibiotics and then they had the exact same script to a bunch of other patients exactly the same thing the only word that was changed was at the end they said and the doctor says you have a chest cold which is the same as bronchitis and they said, what do you need? And the patient said, oh, great, it's only a chest cold. Thank God it's not bronchitis. I don't need antibiotics. Isn't that good? I need chicken soup with garlic. So, yes, you do. So how we talk to patients is important. This tells us, number five, is the, the title is, they just say everything's a virus. And, um, you know, that doesn't work so well when you're talking about Ebola <laughs> or HIV. But it does remind us that we don't want to be dismissive of patients. Here's a, they did interviews with 30 parents of children um, who were there for a respiratory infection. And the parents said, you know, what's really bad is when the doctor doesn't seem interested, when the doctor diminishes everything and says, oh, it's nothing, don't worry about it. It's just a virus. And um, so language is important. How you talk to people is important. The good news is this is, a, this is caused by a virus, which means we don't have to give those antibiotics that can cause problems, and it means that he's going to get better on his own. Little Johnny's going to be better. It's going to take a while. The bad news is it's really unpleasant, and it's not going to be better for a few weeks. But the good news is it's going to get better. This is a, if you instead diminish it, why, what was your emergency? Why are you here in the emergency department with just a virus? The more you make it that the patient has somehow didn't, why didn't they know this is a trivial thing, the more problems you're going to have. And that, but I, Jerry, that's Jerry did point. the key move, which is merging paper four and five. It's just a chest cold, and boy, these can be really hard to shake. Johnny's going to be coughing for, for three to four weeks. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, there's not much we can do. We've looked at the cough medicines. They don't help kids this age. They can make them sicker. Give you know, some so honey. it's all about, you know, some Tylenol and some... And some fluids and some chicken soup. I write the grandma cures down. Um, and one other good Johnny thing. Needs. One other good thing. Remember always is bronchospasm also presents as a cough. So if it doesn't look like a respiratory infection, or if it's only at night, it's been going on a long time. Or if you want, run little Johnny up and down in the ear, and he starts wheezing. You've now done something useful. So just keep that in mind. It's most of them it isn't. Mostly it's a cold. But every once in a while, that's how uh, asthma in a little kids presents. Just keep it in mind. Well, and one of their suggestions, this really gets to the show of medicine, that yeah. if you, I mean, we can walk in a room, we've got the, tri the triage nurse now, we've got the vital signs, and we could spend 10 seconds and say it's a virus, you can go home. But if you go through the exam, you look in the ears, you look in the throat, you listen, and you say, ah, ah okay. Oh, yeah. There's a script that goes with it, you press it on the back. Doesn't look like Johnny has an appendicitis. And then you got to look in the ears. Rick always talks about this. Rick always points out it's a one-act play where the audience is the parent and understand that that audience among parents is not created equally. Do not perform the show for the dad. Wait for the mom to get in the room, then do the show. <laughs> She's the important part of the audience. And, it, you know, you have to, you know, and if you don't do certain things, you don't kind of pull the ear back and look in there, that's, that's, that's a miss. You're not being thorough because the mom's judging you 
on your thoroughness, and which is a, the only measure she has for your concern. You got to put the thing in there and make the kid go. <laughs> if you haven't done that, it's not a complete exam. That way you're sick too, so they just yeah. cough all over you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, just, I don't know. I think examining kids is a kick in the pants. I just think they're fun. They're cute. You get to play, you know, what did you eat for dinner? Let me listen. I'm going to look through your ear and see your mom through the other side. It's, it's just fun. It's fun. I love it. Yeah, but you don't have to worry that the light on your ophthalmoscope is working. Don't. don't. <laughs> yeah. It's irrelevant. Don't pretend you actually care about it. Uh, you know, it's like your stethoscope. You're going to be really. thinking I mean, about can, lots of other go, things while you're easily, doing this. easily go through a shift with a roll of toilet paper for auscultation. <laughs> it would be just fine. <laughs> Six. That's a visual. <laughs> okay. This um, paper number six is a is a um, database study that has some conclusions that I think are discussion points and some cr- criticisms that I think are interesting. This is a, a database of over a million trauma patients. So it's an enormous database of, of trauma patients. And what they looked at were outcomes based on whether you were black or white as a trauma victim. So 77% of this were actually white. The trauma victims were white. And if you were um, black, you were more likely to have a penetrating injuries, um, several other types of injuries that were more likely. But the unadjusted and adjusted mortality was higher in blacks than whites. And the paper basically says there is an ethnic disparity in outcomes based strictly on your skin color in trauma victims. That's the sort of general broad brush there are some criticisms of papers like this because they don't know things like confounding factors, where what was people based their basic health, you know, all the other things that can go into this. This is a data dredge, but it does bring up sort of the concept of differences based on color or differences based on language, which are other parts of our medicine. And we talked about biases earlier. There may be things that inherently affect your practice. It's interesting because in trauma centers, those, those of us who work in trauma centers, most trauma protocols or most trauma treatment is pretty protocolized. It's pretty, you know, there's the ATLS approach. Approach and it's pretty much protocol, but this does bring out the idea that perhaps there's some things in, that we don't recognize that may affect outcomes. And part of that too, and this one of the criticisms again is, I don't know people the background of this. What were the basic health of the individuals before they were traumatized, etc. So while well, this is a headline grabber and it's like, it's a kind of right. data dredge with that, and and the purpose of it is probably to get and appropriately so, I'm all for it to get more resources to sort of under underserved urban areas. Uh, that need better trauma. So, yeah, that's the problem with with trauma centers. That most cities have enough trauma centers, but they're not in the right place. Los Angeles is a classic example. We closed MLK, and you know how they talk about food deserts. We created a trauma care desert in a huge urban black population of our city. 40%. LA County alone could uh, LA County alone could could result in this skewed results here because we created a trauma desert for the black population. Yep. Now, no mystery that that also happens to be an uninsured population and, and a variety of other things. Um, but th- I, I think that probably the almost the entire result, even though they tried to deal with confounders and adjust, almost the entire result is surely due to the nature of the penetrating trauma in the uh, black subgroup, which much of it is urban gang violence. And trust me, if someone opens up at you from 10 feet away with a nine mil semi-automatic, you're a lot more likely to die than if you fall off your tractor. Both of them are gonna get you to a trauma center, but if someone lights you up with a nine, you're gonna die. Well, yeah, but but that actually, really that's that's not really right. So, (laughs) what, you think the tractor's gonna kill more people, Jerry? Or you object to some other part of that? I object to the the notion that you, you, that, this is due to penetrating trauma. So Diane's exactly right that this type of study, there are many confound, potential confounders that you cannot control for. There are many such things. So we don't really know the truth of this. This is just an estimate. But they did control for penetrating trauma. They did control they for did exactly. They did their best to control for it. They did exactly yeah. for the thing you're worried about. So that's yeah. not the explanation yeah. of this. There may be other things that have nothing to do with ethnicity. On the other hand, while it's certainly true that this type of study can't prove what it's saying, it, is, it would be extraordinary if it were not true. Because every single study that has ever looked at variability in treatment according to ethnicity finds unexplainable differences in the way care is given. That's true when you look at the elderly versus non-elderly. It's true when you look at little kids versus uh, others. And it's 
true for every ethnicity that it's been looked at. It's also true for people who have, um, who have mental diseases, get worse care. Not that anybody in their mind is, is, is uh, saying, oh, I don't want to treat this person because he's got schizophrenia, but we give them worse care, and that's measurable. And it's been shown for ethnic minorities in every study that's ever looked for post-operative care. Did they get all the things that are protocolized that we all expect? No, they don't. Did they get equal analgesia? No, they don't. There are many, many studies in just about every way you can look in the same hospital with the same doctors with the same resources where people who are black or Hispanic or whatever are getting different and less care than people who are white. And we, so for me, the take home point is really simple. Just be aware of this. We have unconscious biases that we don't, we would be shocked when they show pictures of, of um, uh, you know, all these psych experiments where people go through these things and they, they, they have different subconscious reactions to people who don't look like them. And, we, you know, we would feel horrified if we imagine, not me, but in fact, we as a group, it's got to be some of us. So just be aware of it and tr and try to keep it in mind. And, you know, we d I did it. I supervised the Knox Todd's famous study about different analgesia to Hispanic patients versus white patients at UCLA, and for absolutely no justifiable reason, they had nothing to do with. They complained less. They graded their pain less. The doctors graded their pain less. None of that. Despite all that, all those things be equal. The Hispanic patients got much less pain medicine. Uh, nobody, there was, there, nobody was saying, I don't want to, I want to mistreat them. They just somehow didn't notice the person's pain. Go ahead, speak up. No, final outcome. Final outcome. Final outcome. This is yeah. final outcome. They don't look so at transport times. They don't look yeah. at what, what the proximity was to trauma. They could have extracted that. No, it was final outcomes, and but, just sort of. But don't we find it that hard to believe? Because again, yeah. in my place, where there's lots of Hispanic doctors and lots of Hispanic nurses, in our emergency department, if you broke the exact same bone and you were Hispanic versus white, you got different care. Even though we talk about this all the time. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. it just most of these differences are not things that we would imagine. They're subconscious. Go ahead. Is there any uh, variation considering the, the racial makeup of the treating provider? That's a good question. N no, although in our study we did try to look at that. We uh, and while we don't really have the power to find subtle differences, because there weren't it, that many in your guys' study, right? Well, there there were, but just when you break it down into multiple subgroups, there weren't that many people in any subgroup. We didn't seem see any obvious difference when the doctor was Hispanic or the nurse was Hispanic. They seem it still was. It seemed like they were part of medical culture. They identified mm -hmm. as doctor yeah. or nurse right, more rather, than they yeah. did with ethnicity, so that. The same thing held. Again, it, this is not something that any of us would be proud of or that we believe about ourselves. So we have to actually recognize it. Wow, it seems weird. And just try to keep it in mind so that we can avoid it. And I would just, again, and I got it, the adjustments. And I, and I understand Jerry's um, counter of, of what I, my point was. But I will just point out that when you look at the, the demographic of the black population in this study, it was younger, it was male, it was uninsured, and it was disproportionately intentional violence. Right, but those were those were the things that they adjusted for. They, they couldn't I don't adjust think for. You can that's, a, that's, a, that's the oh, criticism yes, of the study. No, a nine millimeter is different from a twenty-two, and and <laughs> and it is. I mean, we see it all the time. All the time. You, you I can, don't think you can. They adjusted for all of those things. They, they tried. Said, well, okay, but there are. <laughs> they try. Absolutely. I appreciate seven. it. So, seven, and so I, I think that, and I would like to differentiate abstract six, which I think is mostly about manipulation of numbers and things, and it does grab a headline, and I'm, I'm fine with the headline it grabs. I'm fine with the conclusion it reaches that we, could, that we could do better and should allocate resources better. As opposed to seven, which is about physicians and bias, which is really much more about what Jerry's talking about, this thing about yeah, sort of what we talked about a little this morning. And, and yeah. cultural stereotypes where, where biases exist um, in, a, in a very sort of sub rosa, sort of under the, um, under the layer way. 
And this is not really a, a study per se, um, but what it does, and it says some good things. It's from University of Wisconsin in Madison. It's, the author's name is Chapman. And it says he just wants to promote a, awareness of this and emphasize that a physician try and put themselves in the, in the shoes of their patient. I talk to the residents about this all at the time. There are various questions you can ask patients that shows you're putting them in your shoes. Uh, and one of the ones I like a lot, for example, it, and it has nothing to do with this paper per se, but is, you know, do you need a note for work? What kind of work do you do? That means you're thinking about what the patient's next day is like. Uh, you're, you're putting yourself in their shoes. And so exercises where you formally do that are one of the things that's recommended by this author to mm -hmm. help try and uh, make a conscious effort and correct for these um, biases which you might not be aware of. And it is true that you understand, um, it was funny, we had a, I'm Irish Catholic from Boston, so we'll get to all those stereotypes out. And one day, we don't see a lot of Irish Catholic people in our ER in, in Los Angeles, but one day we did, and they died. And the, a weird thing happened, which I haven't seen in a long time, which is somebody started keening. And for those of you who don't know, no. keening, a keening, Irish are so fucked up they don't know how to cry, so they need someone to help them cry, so you have a keener, which begins the wailing processes, and then they can all cry. And so someone started keening in our emergency room, and, and people were like, what the fuck is going on over there? They were like, I can't, you know, and I was like, don't worry about it, it's, you know, it, it'll go away in a little bit, but it, it, this is how it's, you know, <laughs> but they'd never seen it, and they had no idea what was going on, but I understood it, because that's, that's the culture I grew up with, and so it was very easy for me to interact with, but for, for other cultures where you're not as aware, there is less ability to make that, that connection. Um, and so you see it, in, it, it uh, cr I think this goes in all directions, this sub-liminal, sub under-the-ground one. And I think Seven's a pretty good paper that just talks about promote your awareness, put yourself in the patient's shoes, keep your mind open to what's going on, um, and uh, maybe we can, to some degree, correct for these subliminal unconscious biases. Right. It, we are all subject to our, to our unconscious mind, and it, yep. because we make so many decisions on rapid-fire basis, um, we sometimes things get in the way, our biases get in the way. And the notion is, nobody's ever proved this, but I think it's probably true, is that there's a concept of metacognition. Step outside yourself, recognize the, the pitfalls of what you're doing, and maybe that can help you do better. And that's true for all the things that Diane talked about this morning. It's also true for biases, like the ones that this paper talks about. It's a nice paper. And again, two things that they talk about is um, one, trying to put yourself in the patient's shoe, and the other thing is to try to see that person as an individual rather than as who they are, which ethnic group they are, they're old, whatever it is. If you can see the person as an individual and then go even one step further and say, how would I feel if I were in their place and I didn't know the medicine, so I don't know that this is benign, but I'm really scared because it seems like a big deal, I can do a much better job. And I, I think that's all of those are true. I think it's fun to go into a shift. I don't know, when you get older and you practice, things change a little bit. And I, I like to go into every shift trying to figure out a way to come out a better person at the end of the day. Um, rather than making people better as well, how do I become a better person at the end of the day? And I think at least one or two, making an exercise in this as a, as a practice, it makes you a better person too. So it's kind of a win-win all the way around. And every now and then you can kind of feel yourself do that shift. I had a patient yesterday, a homeless guy, came in after being hit in the mouth, and his teeth were hurting, and his lip was a little cut, and I'm just already in my role, you're waiting for the Percocet request, and they say, do you need anything for the pain? He's like, well, maybe just some Tylenol, Doc. I've had so many of my buddies, they start off on the Percocet, and then they end up buying heroin, <laughs> and I'm like... And then suddenly we're on the same page. It was so great. It's like, ah, oh, you Tylenol coming Let's your way, man. Let's go for beer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's what, what did you think he, that he wanted some Percocet, so he went and got himself hit in the mouth? Was that your... <laughs> <laughs> the Percocet is a little side, side request. All right, abstract eight. I, I thought it was interesting, is especially for those who work in a trauma center, uh, which I no longer do, but did for 15 years, uh, at least in part. They point out that... Obviously, there's a purpose for a trauma center that it's to take care of the most seriously injured patients. Uh, but if you take people just based on mechanism of injury, you're going to do what they consider was over triage. So you end up with a lot of people who really don't need to be in the trauma center. They defined over triage as patients who were in and out in under six hours. And they said this is a charity in New Orleans. Prior to 2005, 
part of the paramedic protocols had to involve mechanism of injury, and they found that 45% of the people who were transported to charity were there just because of mechanism of injury, and they said their over triage rate was two thirds, 66%. And then after 2005, they just said, look, it's only going to be on anatomic and physiologic pro properties and not mechanism of injury anymore. So you, you bring them if they meet these physiologic anatomic criteria, but pure mechanism of injury is no longer a criteria to bring them to the level one center. And they found that their rate of transportation dropped. Uh, only 5% were taken to the trauma center due to mechanism of injury and their over triage rate dropped down to 9%. So it's not a surprise that you start tightening up the criteria, you're going to bring fewer people in. They don't address whether they are now missing some of the patients who really should have been there and weren't, but certainly this is one way to decrease some of the crowds in the uh, level one trauma center. So they did, they, uh, having been down there and talked to this group that published this, they did look at some secondary triages later to see if there were. There were a little more but mostly they had the right target. This is about a conflict, a political conflict between two specialties. Yeah. So who gets hurt by over triage? The ER docs get pounded by patient after patient. It doesn't bother the surgeons any. They still only operate on the three that needed surgery. So the, a the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma has, a, has actually publicly stated that, that trauma is destination specific more than time specific. So you wanna match patient needs to facility resources. Right, cardiac arrest, the other way around. Time specific, more than destination specific. By the way, so trauma, you got this destination specific entity, and they want, they're okay with over triage rates of 40%, as long as the under triage rate, meaning a subdural at a community hospital with no neurosurgeon, because that's a real bear when that happens, as long as the under triage rate is less than 5%. That's the numbers they float out. But here in another underserved black urban population in New Orleans, the ER docs are like, hell no, you're killing us with the over triage. You're gonna sink this emergency department and bury it with overcrowding if you accept an over triage rate of 66% because you're punishing the ER docs in that facility. And so what they said is, can we please retreat and go back to the physiologic triage guidelines that are much more accurate and have a functional ED that isn't buried in over triage while still catching the vast majority of the important trauma cases that needed to be there. Right. And that's what this is all about is this conflict. You know, so when the Committee of Trauma, when the ACSCOT says we're comfortable with a 40% over triage rate, every year doc should be like saying, no, we're not. So I'm, you're not I'm, just punishing. I'm not comfortable with that. You're not just punishing the ER docs, you're punishing patients because while it may yeah. be a tragedy to miss a patient who's out there in a place where they can't be cared for, you actually make m care much worse at the place that is over busy when you're swamped with patients who have nothing and makes us more likely to miss the patient who has something and it also gets in the way. We, there's lots of studies that show that the more you concentrate on A, the less the Poorly, the more poorly you do with B. When you have more trauma patients, heart attack suffer. When you have more heart attack patients, strokes suffer, et cetera, et cetera. I think there are a couple of good take home points here in general. One is that you can't be sensitive and specific both. You have to sacrifice one for the other. So if you want to never miss a subdural, a bad trauma, you have to take everybody to the trauma center and then specificity goes to hell. You got to find some balance. And the second thing that goes along with this I keep talking about is if you want to find that needle in the haystack, there's a cost. If all we talk about is I don't want to miss that subdural, we're going to end up doing a lot more harm than good. And we do that when we overadmit chest pain that have nothing and when we overdiagnose pulmonary emboli. And there are millions of examples of now we've gone to, I can never miss that needle in the haystack. And we forget to think about all the costs, not and to well, mention and one thing the economic cost. Right, tied to this, not just economic costs, but the, the money is tied to this. Do you know so how you much a TTA costs? A trauma team activation, what the average charge to a patient is? So I'm talking charges, not costs, so let me be clear about that. But the average charge is about $20,000 before they provided any care. You, at my Crazy. hospital, if you ring a TTA, that's twenty k. Whoa! Not, not to mention that, if you really think about it, since almost no patients actually go to the operating room, trauma is actually not a surgical disease. 
The vast majority of trauma is a non-surgical disease. Some of the whole concept is a little crazy. But I, one other little thing I want to say, say that's another important take-home point. I've been talking about, you know, gee, in our studies, and we have big studies, and the Nexus database for various different outcomes is huge. We've never found that mechanism of injury actually is a good predictor. That is, let me be clear, if you have a worse mechanism of injury, you're more likely to be sick. That's for sure. If you have a trivial mechanism, you're not sick. If you have a bad mechanism, you're more likely to be sick. But it doesn't add to what we can see in the patient in front of us. And not only did we find that nexus, but there's data from the LA pre-hospital system from 30 years ago that shows exactly this, that if you start adding these mechanism things in, mostly all you're getting is huge amounts of over triage. Despite the fact that their own data proved this 30 years ago, they decided to include all these crazy mechanism of things. Did, was there passenger chase and space intrusion? Did the door come in? Oh, was somebody else hurt? Yeah, this person is dead, but I'm fine. Doesn't matter. You've got to go to the trauma center. It turns out all those things add is false positives. A lot of them with bad mechanism are sick, but they're obviously sick. And the one, So, again, a core Based principle for me is look at right. the patient in front of you. That's where we get our information. I, I'm, I was glad to see this because I've been saying this for years and years. And yeah, years. it had gotten, for those of us who work in L.A. County, it had gotten so ridiculous at one point that they had the inches of passenger space intrusion measured. If it was 11 and a half inches, it wasn't a transport. If it was 12 inches, it was. I mean, I wouldn't even take out tape measures. It was ridiculous. It had gotten crazy. But I think one of the sort of ugly little background things is it's not just a TTA activation. It's $20,000. There is a lot of money from governmental agencies to support trauma centers and numbers. So There's they a want lot their of, numbers They high. want their numbers. We're, and Billy and I are in the middle of all of this trying to get the numbers up. We're stuck. We're, I don't want to activate anything, but we have these rules now so that, the num so, so that they can support the financial And if you don't part activate because the patient looks Ugh. good, you're written up, statement of concern. Big time. I mean, the pressure, you, you, there's no fighting it. You'll, Number you'll nine is more of the same. It's, it's really, I don't think it's really worth spending any Actually, time Actually, I do. So okay. that's mine. And I want to talk about it because those, how many of you, <laughs> seriously, how many of you work in a center where nice you try, have Jerry. to... Nice try, Jerry. <laughs> where you have to transfer a trauma patient because this, yeah. so look at this. I mean, this is what you this have to deal world. with. This is your world. This is your, we're on the receiving end and we've got all the jazz there. You, I, my heart goes out to you because you have to sit at the bedside of a trauma patient and figure out what do you do? Do you transfer them or not? Do you do the tests at your institution? Do you wait and have the test done somewhere else? Do you delay care for that? Can you fly them? Do you drive them? I, mean, I don't envy you at all what you have to do. This is a paper that somewhat um, disses the practice of rural then transfer trauma care. And it basically it says that there's an over triage transfer. 25% of the people that get transferred from wherever they, and 62% of the total patient population, you basically sent six out of 10 people from your institution to a trauma center. And of those people, 25% ended up not needing the services of that trauma center. It was felt to be an over triage, an overuse which may very well be the case, but I don't, I don't envy the position that you're in in trying to figure out what to do for people who may deteriorate. You don't have the backup services. You don't have a neurosurgeon. You don't have that stuff. I have no trouble with transferring. What I think is important about this are two things. One is don't do a bazillion tests at the transferring end. Okay, you don't have to. If you have a quick trans and you've got an agreement, you can get them transferred quickly. We have a tra in our LA County. If if someone goes to a non-trauma center and is critically ill trauma-wise, 911 gets called and they get brought to us from the ER to the ER. Basically, not tests not done. They come straight to us. They it's like it, it's just like oops, wrong place. They come right to us, which is fine. That's absolutely fine to do. So don't do a bunch of tests or do all that you need and we won't repeat them. So send us the pictures. Make sure all the pictures yeah. get sent for that. The other part of this is that I think this is going to change. As we get better at things like telemedicine and better at sort of doing sort of consultations over phones and we have a better network for support where you can actually still take care of someone where you are and keep them where you are, we may end up with this as an evolving practice. So right now I think it's fine. These numbers say, oh, how terrible overuse. I'm not sure that's true at all. And I think we're going to get better at figuring out how to work where you don't have to transfer everyone and we have other resources available. So I agree with Diane completely. And for a long time our policy at our hospital hospital with regards to trauma triage was Red Rover, Red Rover, send over whatever you got. Whatever you got. Um, but this paper is a diss because they called it an unnecessary trauma triage if the patient was there for less than 48 hours. Well, if it was so unnecessary, what the hell were they doing in the trauma center for 48 hours? Right. To me, if they had to stay 48 hours, 
That means someone did serial belly exams or serial neuro exams. Um, so I think that's really unfair to use state at the trauma center for, for 48 hours or less as a way to say it was an unnecessary referral. So for example, so, a fair number of burst fractures, we get spinal transfers all the time. They don't always go to the OR. Some of these are stable mm -hmm. uh, when they've actively been looked at, but they get neuro checks for 48 hours by someone who knows what they're doing, who could intervene. Most of the time, nothing's done. Does that mean that was an unnecessary transfer? Oh, by the way, they also, from the trauma center, get referred to our spine rehab center that is unavailable to the rural hospital. Does that, you know, so how are you going to get those patients? So, in? so, so this is why I said I don't think we really need to <laughs> do this paper is because it comes to the wrong conclusions for all the reasons they just said. It, it says, gee, aren't you bad? You've transferred all these patients, and that's wrong. So that's why I didn't think we needed to. Well, of course, one of the things that this paper is dealing with is not an emergency medicine problem because we might feel perfectly comfortable taking care of a lot of these people, but they can't stay in the ED for 36 hours and you can't find someone to admit them to. So when your, your surgeon in the hospital who's a general surgeon says, oh, that's trauma, I don't do trauma, transfer the patient, you say, well, there's really nothing much wrong with them and I think, no, nope, you gotta go. So yeah. it's not our call, it's, it's Well, the and consultants. most of the transfers happen on the weekend or at nights. Right? No surprise no there, surprise. No there's surprise. a big mystery. Number 10 is just, a, it's kind of an odd, oh, go oh, please. Just a comment, I'm one of the guys sending those to me, thank you to you. And we're happy to have them. As everybody's crunching numbers and everybody's doing MR and they're collecting all this data, we've got the encounters that are going to take this a step further potentially, yep. as well as attorneys, uh, among government agencies, and they're going to impose a more rigid set of transfer criteria. We don't want to make our job whether we transfer this more difficult than it already is. Uh, so the pushback to the leaders in the field is you guys kind of can't be that to be expecting that to happen. Yep. Although I have to tell you, the EMR may be helpful, not harmful. So part of the EMR, it's, it's a slippery slope. It can go either direction. You can slide off either side. And perhaps what they'll find is we don't want to be transferring all these people. And we have teleradiology and we have telemedicine. And it's much more cost of it. People are worried about money now. They, they're, they're, we're spending... But I, I think the other view of it is it's in anticipation of that. Let's first get our radiology systems to share. Let's get our PAXs up and online so that we can have our neurosurgeon or our orthopedic spine surgeon or our... Um, you know, whatever specialists look at it. So we can share information. So I think that for me, the teleradiology is the preemptive move and the building of those relationships. Let's build those relationships in a much more positive way. And I don't think this paper helps build them at all. One of the things I think you can get into trouble with in the places that you're talking about where you don't really have the resources to care if the patient is going to deteriorate is when you admit a patient to be observed because that doesn't actually make sense if they're, because then they deteriorate and now you're two hours away from the place. So I think it's perfectly reasonable and per perhaps with help, with teleradiology and a lot of stuff to be able to say, no, these people can go home and we don't have to worry about them. Yeah, there's everybody, there's a needle in the haystack out there. They have to come back if, but for the most part, we're content, everything's good. But if you're worried enough that they need to be in the hospital, those are the patients who should be transferred and this, Dissing you for transferring them, I think, is absolutely unconscionable. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. The other thing is not only if they deteriorate upstairs because they don't want to take care of them. I know how to get people out of my hospital to your hospital. People upstairs, I know who I am. So right. Mary Margaret's yeah. comment is that once they're upstairs, they may be lost. Maybe nobody is observing them. And even worse, when they do get worse, we in the ED know how to get them to the trauma center, but upstairs they have no idea. So The emergency medicine world is remarkably small. So uh, even at the community hospitals re re related to around LA County, I, I often will, I can remember being on three o'clock in the morning and talking to six or seven hospitals for various reasons. I knew everyone was up across the whole city. So we can build those relationships is my point. Number 10. It's kind of an odd paper. It's a it's a, a decision analysis of the PCARN data. Basically, this is what this paper does. Is it, to me, it does two take-home points of this paper. One is to understand what a decision analysis paper is, and it's basically a person or a group of people sitting in a room 
making up a certain idea of assumptions. I assume this rate of disease, this cost of that disease, this many tests will usually be done for that disease. This is the outcome. These are my assumptions. This percent of this, that percent of that. And what I'm going to do is crunch it around to figure out where's a break point. Where's the break point where it's, I, it's worth doing these tests, it's not worth doing these tests. That's what a decision analysis is. It isn't any, any randomized controlled anything. It's a bunch of, so any decision analysis paper you see, you have to go to the assumptions and make sure you agree with what those people decided were the basic sort of playing field. Right. That's, and that's crucial because some decision analysis papers come up with conclusions, you know, CT everybody. It's like, what are you thinking? It's because they misestimated what proportions of disease or outcomes might be. So that's the, what, that's one part of this. The other part of this paper is they came up with a percent of possible bad injuries, brain injuries in kids based on PCARN which has its own issues, and, and when you should do a thumbs up, thumbs down scanning. If, if, if in a, a population, it's this percentage of kids that have a significant brain injury, then you should be scanning them all. To be honest, that is not pertinent to me at the bedside of an individual child. That doesn't help me. So this paper is more to me helpful for you to understand what a decision analysis paper is than any conclusion that you can take back to your practice. Yeah, the notion that you should do something for everybody if the rate in the whole group is X, it says, well, I can't, I can't use any judgment about this person in front of me. Not every not kid who comes in with head trauma has the same 4% risk or 5%. Maybe in the group of them it was 5%, but this kid is sicker or this kid is fine. So uh, I, you know, I can't agree but, more. Use your judgment in, de in deciding these things. Dave so. Frager, uh, who's a, an EBM person who Jerry has worked with, for you, gives a fabulous lecture that's titled When N Equals One. And he just points out how EBM does and doesn't apply to a single patient encounter. <laughs> and the classic story is cardiac risk factors. If you were taking care of the entire city of Framingham, then whether you had hypertension, smoking, diabetes, cholesterol, all those things would be tremendously useful. The problem is, is that you're not taking care of the entire city of Framingham, you're taking care of one person in front of you, which is why whenever they look at cardiac risk factors and how they perform as a solo feature in identifying someone who has ACS, they don't. A third of MIs have one or none. So if the only way you're gonna look for MIs is by asking about risk factors, you gotta be comfortable missing a third. Yeah, number 11. 11 is, a, is a, a paper from Davis as well. Nate Cooperman's there. This other paper at 10 above is PCARN. Nate Cooperman's the head of PCARN. This is all about CT risk, appreciating the risk of testing in kids. Remember that when you expose someone to radiation, both age and gender matter. The younger you are when you get exposed, the more time you have to develop your solid tumor, your lymphoma, your leukemia, you know, something like that. Um, and so, you know, who cares if you're CTing 80 year olds, the chances of them being dead before they can develop a tumor is very good. But if you're CTing eight year olds, that tumor is gonna be gonna kill them or have a chance of killing them. So CT, and then gender matters as well because not all tissues are of the same um, um, rate of developing cancer. So breast and thyroid are among the tops. So if you irradiate breast and thyroid, you'll pay in the long run. By the way, there was a recent paper, we all think of this as occurring more than 10 years down the line, and for many of these tumors, it is more than 10 years down the line, but I would just point out, we did a McGill paper a couple years back that looked at act not estimated cancers, but actual measured cancers, and found that in response to radiation, you can start measuring excess cancers as soon as five years out. And that was plain x-rays with one rad. Right. It wasn't CT scan. So this paper says, all right, let's look at kids who get exposed and what are the cancer estimates. It says that children equal 5 to 11 percent of the 85 million CTs done in the United States. There's a lot of variability in the radiation dose because the person, the tech who's doing the CT doesn't employ the lowest allowable radiation concept, so-called ALARA approaches. They don't, in other words, they don't dial up or down the radiation exposure based on the size of the thing they're putting on the gantry. So that obviously if you put a small thing on the gantry and give it adult doses of radiation, that's a higher exposure for that kid. So he notes that that's a problem. And then what they did is that in 744 of these kids, they actually d uh, did dose determination. And if you said 20 millisieverts, which is a well-known dose that will start giving you thyroid cancers, breast cancers, and other things, if that's your sort of, ouch, we went too heavy with the radiation cutoff, they found that 25% of kids' CT of the abdomen and pelvis exceeded that. 8% of their CTs of the chest 
exceeded that. And 14% of the CTs of the spine exceeded that 20 millisieverts cutoff where you could expect there to be hell to pay in a kid who gets a radiation exposure down the road. And so they said these, in these seven, um, kids, there, and the, if you did this across the whole group, there would be over 5,000 excess cancers in this pediatric group. And they said, use these estimates as a way of saying we got to back off. But they say, next, the next part of the paper is, let's just look if we did the Alara thing, lowered the doses for these kids, and it said that by de just changing the dose exposure, you could get below um, 20 millisieverts in a quarter of the scans. And if you were more challenging about who needed CT, like you observed a kid rather than head CTing them, observed them for two, four, six hours, whatever you want, or did some other things to avoid getting CT scans, like getting ultrasounds on all your pediatric appies, that that could eliminate another third, and that very easily you could decrease the radiation exposure with no new technology right now by 60%. Uh, you could get a lot of these kids well below these cancer thresholds. And that's all obviously really good, and I, I think it's important for us to be aware of, regardless of whether we know the exact details, that radiation is not a good thing, particularly in little kids, and we can use that in talking to parents about, you know, what should we do here? We're going to talk about shared decision-making. Parents don't want you to radiate their kids, if you put it that way. And so there are ways in which we can use that. But I, I'm going to, uh, one of the themes that I'm going to, come back to over and over and over again over the next few days is that the real, the greatest harms of unnecessary testing has nothing to do with radiation. It has to do with finding things that we don't know what they mean and which lead to down the, the line terrible consequences. So that, in fact, an MRI, I would argue, actually has the potential to do a lot more harm than CT, even though it has no radiation, because it's a, quote, better test, because it finds more and more of less and less. So I just want to, I'm going to come back to this over and over again, but I just want to warn you that radi getting rid of radiation is a good thing. But it's not the real problem. The real problem is doing tests that don't really have a likelihood of helping you or maybe we'll find a needle in the haystack once in a blue moon, but while you're doing that, will cause all sorts of problems. Over here. I got a problem. We have all of these concerns. I don't hear of any martial aid to downplay some of this. What does the American College of Radiology say? They're with us. They actually want us to order them less. So just to Position repeat statements. his comments so everybody can hear, we're talking about all these big problems, but where's the world of organized medicine talking about why are we overdoing all this stuff? And I, I, I can tell you that at least we're starting, there are starting to be initiatives in this, in this way. You've heard about the Choosing Wisely campaign where so, you know, we talk about what are five things that your specialty is doing we shouldn't do. It's despite our initial reluctance to take part in this, ASAP did eventually hear its members say, are you crazy? Of course we have to participate. And ASAP is participating and most specialties are. It's not actually a terribly good campaign because you can pick things that are not terribly important and not talk about the really big ones. In our case, for example, what about over testing for non-pulmonary embolism or doing no risk, no risk chest pain getting admitted. These are big, big ticket items. Overreading. Uh, over There's billions of them. But in any case, but at least we're starting to talk about it. And it's not just the Choosing Wisely campaign. The Archives of Internal Medicine, which is no longer the archives, it's now called JAMA Internal Medicine, has a section every single issue called Less is More where they talk about this. The British Medical Journal has an equivalent section. There is a, the Lown Institute has this big national initiative to try to say, this is crazy. Gil Welch, who wrote a fabulous book that you should all read uh, called Overdiagnosis, or Overdiagnosed, which is the companion to Shannon Brownlee's wonderful book, Overtreated, is all over this, and he has a blog on CNN, which he's constantly writing about this, and occasionally in the New York Times, his op-eds, et cetera. At least we're starting to talk about it, but we have a huge way to go. But specifically to your question regarding the radiologists, they are with us, they're with it as well. So the ACR has put out position statements about some over-ordering. They have been actively developing decision support software, of which we are now <laughs> testing some at our hospital, which is you can't order a CTPA rule out PE, Unless you want to have a conversation here, you have to enter in some things. And they'll, if you enter in the data, it'll come back CTPA probably not indicated in this patient. And so, you know, you could override that in our hospital. It's not, that's not going to be binding. 
but we are developing some things to challenge people's overuse. Our, nowadays, I, it's really common in minor blunt head trauma and peds for one of the strategies that's been very effective is we, we consult the pediatricians. We don't just consult the trauma people. And the pediatricians come in and say, don't scan that kid. We'll watch him for four hours. We'll call you if anything changes. So now I have, now it's not just me versus quote unquote the expert about, because the expert wants me to pan scan him. Now it's me and the pediatrician saying, I don't think they need a scan. And now the person who was saying pan scan him is there like, all right, whatever. If you're willing to watch, I'm fine. But so as, to speak, we turn it into two against one. As clinicians, the easy argument we've had is the radiation. And it's very easy to say to patients or the parents, hate to radiate the kid because we know radiation can cause cancer down the road. But as Jerry points out, that the much harder intellectual argument is we might find something we don't know what to do with, we might find incidental omas, and I think that's very hard for a lot of families to wrap their head around. It is a very hard thing, yeah. and particularly when you're talking with underserved populations, what they often hear is, uh, you don't want to do it because I don't have money, and you would do it in the, that white guy at the rich hospital, and and uh, that's understandable. So this is, a, it can be a difficult thing. I always want to say one more thing about this philosophically, which is somebody said before, it, what the leaders in the specialty need to do, and I just want to remind you that it really is what we all do. We all have to be part of this conversation. I just, you know, ASEP last year, some of you know, made a new policy about TPA for stroke, which said it was a, we should do it. And it created an should. enormous amount of outrage amongst members. And I got a lot of, since people know that I think it's a bad idea, I got a lot of calls, what are you doing about this? And I, my answer was always, what am I doing about it? What are you doing about it? Eventually, a number of state chapters, Billy helped organize this, including the California chapter, made a resolution to combat that. And then it got to the council, and the council voted three to one to say, this is a bad resolution, take it back. And amazingly, under a lot of pressure, ASAP actually did take it back, and they opened it up for review, and the review was hugely negative, don't do this. And then amazingly, I was stunned, they actually said, we're gonna repeal the policy. And then they made a new policy based on a different guideline panel. And this guideline panel had a, a, a revolutionary rule to it. You couldn't have a conflict of interest, you could, a monetary conflict of interest that tied you to the maker of the drug. And when that happened, suddenly the science changed. It was no longer science is science, and we've proven it. Now the science was, no, this doesn't prove it at all. And actually, the, now the new draft is not you should do it. So, and the reason I mention that is because it, it, we have rare victories in this world. But this is, shows us that when we really care about th something, not when I care about or Billy or Diane or David, but when we all care about something, it's big we actually have a, the, we do have clout. And so it's not up to the American College of Radiology to do this. It's up to us to do it. And to talk to our patients about it, which is critical. Even Jared's though it's already hard. talked about Choose Wisely. Initially, ASAP decided not to uh, join the Choose Wisely campaign. And the big we again, meaning members, uh, also got them to change that. So ASAP actually, shock of shock, responded pretty well to membership feedback on those and took what were initially not their positions. Abstract so. 12, uh, 4,000 clicks. I really like the title. A productivity oh. analysis of electronic medical records in the community hospital ED. So they point out that EMR is meant to improve communication and patient safety and theoretically to reduce error, none of Bullshit. which is really proven. <laughs> <laughs> But nobody's really looked at its effect on uh, provider efficiency and productivity. This is a study that they tracked 16 attending physicians, residents, mid-levels, and just watched how they performed over the course of shifts. And what they found, I, I think for those of us who have certainly implemented an EMR, not just live with an EMR, but they found that participants spent 44% of their time on data entry. So here we are with our MDs and residencies, and we're data entering 44% of our day. That's and a how really does that useful economic uh, Really good. How policy. does that compare to the time for direct patient care? 44% data entry, 28% direct patient uh -huh. care, 12% in review of tests. So like we, we get to think 12% of the time, and we're data entering 44% of the time. So, and they said this is consistent with other studies that we spend 30 to 40% of a workday used solely for data entry. 
which Not is why I think a lot how many of, of you how many of you had to learn more than three EMRs in the room? Mm -hmm. I'm about to have my fifth and worst. I'm we, about, we already went live I'm, at our in, hospital. We were the trial the hospital. Cerner torture he gets chamber to do it next. right now, and oh. and this four thousand click thing. There's this. So and one of the problems I have with it is Cerner is pretty good for the inpatient services and great for the C-suite, but it throws emergency medicine on the under the bus. After the throws, it ties us on the train tracks while they know the train is coming, and it's just terrible. It's the worst thing ever. And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, I have I, I have the three. worst thing ever. Yeah, it is. It so is. I think this is there a are compelling. Probably one or two other things are almost as bad. I don't this, know. This is almost a compelling. As as the gas a compelling paper for scribes. I mean, yes. really, you can spend I don't know twenty bucks an hour, fifteen bucks an hour, whatever it is. How many have scribes out there? Oh, yeah. So wonderful. How many have dragon? Or some dicta yeah. Yeah, at least that's that. helpful. Uh, dragon, so we're getting you get a Cerner mishmash. without Dragon, just so you yeah, can have lovely. some pity. Scribes, so our, yeah, scribes, I'll tell you what happened. You our residency, to. our re you know, their duty hours restrictions now for residents, and our shifts were kind of adjusted to that. Well, now the residents are staying anywhere between two and four hours after their shifts to get their documentation done because of the four thousand clicks. So we're having to change the residents' shifts, meaning that their patient care is now even shorter, so they can factor in the time on the computer. That they're already seeing between three and six hundred less patients during a residency than I saw in my residency, just wow. from duty hour restriction. And now we're going to eat into that even more. It's it's. Absolutely. And that the other day when the resident said, well, I just go into the, into the room and I just do all my stuff while I'm talking to the patient. Patients do not like that. That breaks down that doctor-patient, you know, practitioner-patient barrier. It, it, it just blocks it completely. It, it, this is a big problem. And all you have to teachers, do is... It's unbelievable. They're not, they're, not doing, they're not doing patient care anymore. They can't yeah. examine people anymore. They can't talk to people anymore. It, but it's also very difficult either. to teach them to chart because I have no chart to look at until four hours after their shift. Right. This I can't is, teach what to chart. And this is uh, just the emergency docs. What about um, nurses? You ever walk into a busy ER and you look? Take, just take a look. There's a row of nurses sitting by a computer. There's nobody doing work. They're just doing this crap. This is this is really bad stuff. And anyway. our nurses have no notes anymore. They yeah. they've clicked the right. this 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 bed rails up and call light within position five rights given and, and all advised. that crap. Mm -hmm. And if you want to figure out how's the patient, there's nothing in the nurse record anymore, anymore for that. Number thirteen is a about is sort of an ethics paper. It says you know New York State has manda ma mandated that if you want to work in a hospital, you have to take have an influenza vaccine, and um, or you have to wear a mask and. Um, Critics of this say that's not fair. It's an affront to personal liberty, et cetera, et cetera. And this guy argues the opposite. And I, you know, for me, this is a no-brainer. Um, I forget the details about the influenza vaccine, whether or not it's good or bad. It's not perfect, for sure. But the more important thing is, I, I don't see how we can argue anything other than if you sign up for this job, part of it is you decide you're going to do what it takes not to put patients at risk. So if you want to go work in the nursery, you cannot have rubella. You have to have a rubella shot, period, Siri. It's, it's done. you have to have your AP, your, your you know, it's so the, the notion that The notion that we should be able to refuse, I don't want to do it, is, I, I, to me is crazy. The details of influenza aside, I personally think it's a good idea uh, medically, but aside from that, if that's what we as a community decide, I, I am, you know, I How find it outrageous that somebody place? says I don't have to do it. Think, mandatory place, show of hands. It, I think it's national now. I think it's a jo joint commission requirement now. Is it? I think it's our CMS. Ah, uh, the of JC showed up. Yeah. It should I, be. So I think it's mandatory now. It and, it, and it is an interesting argument. I understand individual rights, et cetera. I really, I really do. I understand that. But I wouldn't want a pilot flying my plane who doesn't have good vision, who hasn't med made sure, has, doesn't have heart disease. They, they have to go through. And if they can't, they don't fly. And doesn't have some picture of them looking suicidal by the, by the Golden that, Gate Bridge. I knew that was bridge. coming. I knew that was coming. The Golden Gate yeah. Bridge photo, you know, the number one site of suicide in the United States. Like that, would they put that up about after how about the holy here picture on the right? Like great. How about the bridge to Coronado, which has a sign on yeah. it as you're coming on suicide hotline? I'm thinking like, yes. is that if if I'm really walking up there to jump, is that really going to happen? And help? by the way, if we know. see you up there, we're going to refer your kids. <laughs> if you're studying the sign. <laughs> 
If you put on your high beams as you drive by that side so you can read Number it. 14. 14. 14. So Amo Matu was one of the best lecturers ever in medicine, bar none. Um, it has what he calls the school of duh. That there are certain things that are out there that are published that are from the school of duh. This one is from the school of duh. That basically says ED overcrowding kills people, keeps you in the hospital longer, and costs more. And that is, for those of us that work there, that is no surprise. And it, what is interesting about it, though, is that it's not just in the ER. It trickles through the entire hospital. This isn't just the patients that we see that come through the ER. Everybody ends up paying the price for ED overcrowding and holding people in the emergency department. This paper is one of the ones that you can throw in your bag if you want to go talk to your administrator and say, this is a hospital-wide problem. It's not just my problem. Here's the reason it's a hospital-wide problem. You need to deal with this, and we have to work as a system to make this you know, not, not just our downstairs on the bottom floor problem. Which is why this paper, although it does, you, you all know this and it is obvious, that's why it's still useful to have this type of thing, which shows that when the ED gets too crowded, which is a lot of the time, um, it's bad for patient care and it's bad for the hospital. It's, also it's good worth, to have that. It's also worth noting that base be, uh, certain specialty receiving center criteria worsen care for other. So if you're a STEMI receiving center, you'll be really good at STEMI until they make you a stroke receiving center. <laughs> then you'll focus on stroke and do a shitty job on STEMI until they make you a hypothermia post-cardiac erect center. Then you'll do good on that while you do a shitty care on stroke and a shitty care. And, you'll have to and stop if you have a trauma it. center patient come in during that time, care for all three of those will get worse. Well, so I like the idea that everything is, is <laughs> an emergency. Everything is the number one priority. I, I hate is. it when they do that because your shift becomes this. Wolf, wolf, wolf. Wolf, wolf, wolf. Everything's a wolf. You got to cry wolf about everything. I mean, that's I, I got it. I'm there to take care of a few of the wolves, but we all know what the reality is, which is wolf, nothing, nothing, broken bone, you know, boo boo, stitches, wolf. You know, that's the way it's supposed to be. It's you know, but you, you but what they do with these specialty receiving center things is just wolf, 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 wolf. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> For those of you who wanted the soundtrack, that was it. All right. Uh, the scratch and sniff is scary, though. you got to stay away from the scratch and sniff. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> All right. 15 is a, is a great paper. by It's by Growth, uh, is the author, but it's also by Hans House, who was my student, Jerry's resident over time, and he's in, in Iowa, Sorry. and he's the vice chair there. And he's also a representative of the small chapters, so he talks a lot about these rural emergency medicine issues. And this is really fabulous, because in both 2008 and 2012, he got 100% response rate from every emergency room in the state of Iowa as to who's working, who's doing what. Mm -hmm. And we know, for example, whatever number you think it is, I think the last numbers are, there's about 40,000 jobs in emergency medicine across the country, and about 20,000 of those, about half of them are held by emergency physicians who are board certified residency trained. And so the answer is, well, isn't that a shame? We just need to train more to get to those other non-staff places. And this paper says, wake up and smell the coffee. You're never going to staff a lot of these rural places with board certified emergency medicine trained. So what did they find out in 2008? Um, uh, EDs that were staffed all by emergency physicians represented 12% of the total. The same in 2012. Didn't change. They were in the urban areas. They were in Des Moines and whatever, the major cities in Iowa. The rest of the um, emergency departments were staffed by emergency physicians and FPs. Did that change over this four-year period? No. Stayed 65% in both. What did change during that period? Give you one guess. Was the Half number of, of uh, and the amount of patients seen by nurse practitioners and DPAs. physicians assistants went from 30% to 60% of the EDs having some staffing by, and I don't like the term, I'm, there, I'm sure we have several in here, I don't like A the lot. term better than any of you do, by mid-level providers. Advanced I don't know what to providers. do with that term, it's terrible. But, but nurse practitioners and physician assistants staffing is becoming one of the ways that these rural EDs are staffed in conjunction with a, with a few EPs and a few family practice doctors. Which I have to tell you, in a, in, a, in a primary care model, I think that makes some sense. But I have to tell you, I'm sure some of you in this room have been thrown into, you, you get paid less than your physician colleague, you're cheaper. Um, they can fill the gap with you. And you don't necessarily have to have any specific training to do what they're asking you to do. And so you're being thrown sometimes side by side 
expected to do a very high level, high acuity, difficult job, sometimes without the background or the training that you would make you comfortable doing what you're doing. There are only three or four EM physician assistant residency programs in the country. So part of this, I, we teach an advanced practice provider course that um, I have people come up to me often and say, what do I do? You know, I'm really uncomfortable, not an insignificant amount of the time being asked to do what I'm asked to do. What do I do? And I, I apologize to you that, that our specialty has put you in the position sometimes to do things that may be beyond your comfort zone uh, or even your ability level yet. You, know, you don't have the time under you, your belt. You may have asked earlier, Jerry, how many, who are our NPs and PAs here? Wow. God bless you. So welcome. Yeah, let's, God let's bless just you. say that. And you can argue that the rural setting is the most scary setting. Oh, you're not I mean, not you kidding. work in a trauma center, and Let's you get a trauma up. activation, you get a people. 10 people in the room. You got ortho, you got neurosurgery, you got everybody. And it's the easiest thing to take care of. And then yeah. if you're the one person in the rural setting and you get yeah. anything, it, that's a very scary situation. I, I, we're at time now at the end of this. We'll pick up tomorrow uh, at our project number 16, which is series on contrast.